Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. With us today, we have Emily Harmon. She's based in Virginia in the US, and welcome. Thanks, Ross. I'm excited to be here. This is a great topic. I think it's going to be some good fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So with a career that started with 34 years in the Navy, including Mm -hmm. a decade at the Naval Air Systems Command as a director at the Office for Small Business Programs, Emily is the founder and CEO of Emily Harmon Coaching. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's a podcast host and the US Government Account Director for Positive Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And really that's helping employees build mental fitness so they can fulfill their true potential for happiness and contribution to mission success. And in fact, I, Emily, I love the way that you described yourself on LinkedIn, your little video. It said, I've got the heart of a mum, the mind of a senior executive and the experience of a naval officer. So I'd actually yeah. like to begin through you sharing a little bit more about the journey of maybe your transformation as you left the Navy from then maybe what others said you should do to finding the path of what you wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. I'd lo- I love talking about that because, I mean, 34 years, but then if you count my time at the Naval Academy, it's 38. I mean, basically my whole work life from 18 until uh, 2019, from 18 years old till I was 56, was supporting the Navy, either as a midshipman at the Naval Academy or an officer in the Navy or a civil servant. And no regrets about that. I loved it. And I can see how everything that I learned in the Navy, you know, it's easier to look back and just see how it all came together to what I'm doing now. So when I decided to retire, um, I retired at my minimum retirement age, which was 56. And I called my retirement a graduation. I'm like, yes, I'm graduating. I get to do whatever I want, but who am I and what do I want? (laughs) You know, because in the Navy, it's always like mission first, mission first. and you know, I was finally, and I had been a single parent and everything. It was finally a time where I could put myself first, but I realized I didn't really know how to do that. My, my dreams for myself had been buried under a mound of responsibilities, you know, being a single parent, um, being, you know, raising kids, uh, being a contracting officer for the government, um, I did that a lot. And then I was the small business director in my last career for the entire Navy and Marine Corps. And it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it, but it's like, what do I want to do? Um, I knew that I didn't want to take the typical path of being a government consultant. Um, so I decided, you know, I knew that I wanted to be a coach when I was a senior executive. I had a really, that was the first time I experienced working with a coach and I had a really good experience with that. So I thought, well, I'm going to look into, to coaching, Um, And a couple of things that happened to me right after I retired shaped how I ended up working with positive intelligence back in government contracting, which is where I said I'd never end up. But what happened is when I retired and I had, I knew I was, I didn't have to work. So I figured I have all this free time where I can work out. I'm going to be in the best shape of my life. I'm going to, you know, enjoy having fun. But really I found myself busier than ever at my desk. And some days I'd think, well, I guess I could go hiking. I mean, so what I I started working with coaches and what I learned is when we point a finger at somebody and we're a situation or a circumstance and say, you know, like I was, my job is keeping me busy. My boss is keeping me busy. So when I retire, it's going to be just me and I'm going to have a lot of fun. When you point a finger, you have three pointing back at you. So then I, I didn't have anyone to point a finger or, you know, it was me causing myself to be busy. So that's when I really started working with coaches and um, eventually discovering positive intelligence and learning, you know, I have the hyperachiever and the restless saboteur. The restless make, has you looking for the next exciting thing. And I knew that I didn't know how to just relax and how to just be. So it's taken about three years of working on myself to to get there where I can just really just be and not have to be doing in order to feel like I'm worth something. (laughs) That's a big challenge. The other thing that happened with me is three weeks after I retired, my, my daughter called me and said, mom, 
dad has cancer. Now we had been divorced for over 20 years. Um, but you know, we were still, you know, close. And so I helped take care of him. My daughter helped take care of him. He had a fiance who helped take care of him, but within two weeks of his diagnosis, he was paralyzed in both arms from the cancer. And I was there when he passed away five months later. And I could, I'd never been with somebody who died, but I could see, and he didn't talk a lot, but I could got a feeling for what he was thinking. He was looking back on how he had lived his life and he was dying with regrets. I knew it because of the way he had been kind of anx anxious and verbally abusive, you know, just the way he had treated me and my kids. Um, I could just tell he was dying with regrets and that made me really take a look at myself and, and think, okay, how do I want to be feeling when I'm getting ready to take my last breath? And how do I want to look back at my life? And actually, I learned later that one of the sage powers you learn in positive intelligence is the navigate power, which is when you're feeling really stressed about something to do a little meditation where you go to the end of your life, looking back and you, and you ask your elder wiser self, what's important now? And that helps it put in perspective. So I saw Bruce being his elder wiser self, looking back on his life, not having retired, not having enjoyed life, like he was going to waiting for retirement. Those two things really changed how I have lived my life since I retired. It's interesting, isn't it? That these observations that we have of our lives you, you mentioned looking backwards it's easy to make the connections and in fact that's the only way we can join dots is when we join them backwards right the the beauty of trying to join them forwards that's you know dreams goals all of these things but they're they're yet to be made i love the reframe you had about uh, retirement to graduation mm -hmm. and this opportunity of how events our environment other people around us can influence our perspectives and our thoughts. And what a, what a gift that can be in darkness and sadness to um, reflect, to ask mm -hmm. deep, important questions. And often that's not something, I mean, you described it before that you were building that muscle, building the no. muscle of reflection of, of self. It was of service and to something else to, to the mission. Right. Right. And I guess, for many people in their organizations, in their roles, they're often serving a boss, a purpose, a mission in some sense. And I think there is this awakening, this awareness coming in across society of this frequency of um, just some looking at ourselves. What is it we want to be? And the ultimate question, how do I want to be in my last breath and helping us evaluate how we live today so that experience of of coaching it's one thing seeing how it affected you and another deciding ah that's something i fancy doing right what were some of the triggers there emily that led you down that path to uh, become a coach and to start becoming involved in pq as well well i just i just knew that um i always loved mentoring people now coaching is different from mentoring but um when i worked for the navy mentoring was a big deal and the difference is kind of coaching realizes that uh the answer is within the client and asks empowering questions that helps increase the client's awareness um with mentoring it's kind of like emily how'd you make senior executive and i say this is how i did it and that's how i recommend you do it and it may not even apply to you <laughs> You know, so there, it's a little bit different in uh, mentoring and coaching. So that's something to point out. And um, I just, I just have always enjoyed helping other people. So I was going to go to Georgetown and become a coach, but um, Georgetown University, and I'm kind of glad I didn't because um, I backed out of that when Bruce got sick. And I ended up discovering IPEC, the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching, just because I heard somebody that had graduated from that program on a podcast. And I really like that coaching program because it's all about energy leadership. Um, and it's all about managing our energy and how there are seven different levels of energy. And one of the things I learned that, I mean, I've had tons of leadership and training, right? But I never really learned this, that our thoughts generate our feelings 
which generate our actions or our inactions, which generate our results. You want different results. You've got to start looking at your thoughts and questioning them. I mean, I always knew I was busy, but my, my judge in my brain, if you go to positive intelligence told me that, yeah, you're, you're busy. And um, that's the way it's always going to be because your mom was busy and you can't change. And that's not really true. So there, we, we, we have so many limiting beliefs and it's really hard to, it's very difficult to see them in ourselves, in my opinion, without working with a coach. I mean, even I still today work with coaches, even though I'm a coach, because I can't always see the blind spots that I have. So it was just stumbling upon the in Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. And then someone told me about positive intelligence, which really resonated as well. And I think both of those coaching programs kind of go hand to hand. It's all about, you know, the thoughts that we're thinking. And when I talk about how looking back, I can see how it all came together. I mean, I, I have a, so now I'm, um, for positive intelligence, I'm the director of um, government accounts. So I'm responsible for helping bring business uh, to positive intelligence from, you know, to help support federal, state, and local employees to help them strengthen their mental fitness. And so it just all came together perfectly because I have a background in contracts. I also have a background in small business. So I know the challenges of approaching, especially the federal government, but government organizations and having them pay attention to your company. A lot of times they're used to using certain companies. So I know how to do that. Um, I never thought I'd be in sales, but I don't really, I've, I've worked on myself through coaching and changed my mindset about sales. I don't feel like I'm selling anything. I'm inviting and I'm letting people know my experience, how it helped me. And because I'm a government employee, I can see how it could help others, but I'm helping, I'm learning how to, um, it's not really selling. So I don't feel uncomfortable about it. I've kind of changed my mindset about that. And then all of the public speaking experience I had when I worked for the Navy paid off when I hosted my own podcast, um, when I talk with clients and my coaching, when you, when you, when you're quote unquote in sales, a lot of it is asking questions and learning what the cust the client needs, right. And then trying to make a match to see if your product can meet it. So it's kind of like coaching. <laughs> that's how it all came together it and it's amazing isn't it how we can provide a narrative and this thread you know that at some point we go oh yeah that that applies here that doesn't apply that applies this doesn't and we can reframe things you know we might yeah. have a particular identity you know uh, it's often the second thing we ask somebody when we meet them right emily you say us oh, what's your name what do you do right so our identity is so linked to what we do and mm -hmm. when we go through a transition we get a a moment of well i don't know and um, what is that <laughs> yeah. shift and that adaption internally to what do i identify with and sometimes that is a role a career i'm a coach i'm this to maybe we evolve into what some of the outcomes what some of the impacts that i have oh i this is what i do i help people you know realize their full potential or i help people become more mentally fit as you mentioned you know this transition between our society of physical fitness that was that's right. a thing um but mental health is associated with you know bad stuff not the good side you know i Correct. go to the gym well, where do I go to the mental gym? Oh no, that's right. education or that's learning. Now it's totally different about these ways we frame how we can use coaching as one modality. Mm -hmm. And the, the other important thing you mentioned there was about managing our state and our energy flow mm -hmm. and in different contexts, in different environments, in different situations. And I, I think that's so underrated uh, in terms of what support new leaders and everyone needs right now is the ability to understand context, understand situation, and allow energy to flow in ways that are productive for our future selves, you know, so that when no, we take a sure. last breath, we go, yeah, okay, I'm, uh, I'm at peace with my contribution. In terms of um, you know, all of that mix and your session, oh, selling, or oh, I'm not a selling. And so we, <laughs> many people feel oh, a negative to that, to verses of, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a buyer of people's problems, you know, mm -hmm. and I find solutions and I, and some of it is bits of NLP and language, but it actually changes 
our body. It changes, yeah. the, you know, the the flow, the energy of these things. When you even went through that yourself, what were some of the key pieces that helped you reframe from, oh, am I going back? Am I doing something I used to do? Am I selling and I'm not a seller? What goes on in your own mind when you've faced a few of those things to get it to a point where you're smiling, the energy that it's coming through that this is really enjoyable for you? Well, I guess a couple of things like number one, if you read Daniel Pink's book about how we're all in sales. And when I look back at it, when I was in the small business office, I was in kind of sales within the federal government because I had to influence a lot of different people who weren't technically responsible for the small business program. You know, they were the ones awarding the contracts, maybe coming up with the requirements. And I had to influence them as to why it was important to pay attention to small business, you know, but I couldn't control what they did. That's kind of like sales, right? So I, I just changed my perspective on it. Um, I also kind of, I don't know, you know, people tend to think of sales as a used car salesman, but and and, and I probably did that too. I also had this little attitude of, um, well, I don't need the money. So um, I had to really develop some confidence in myself, actually, some self-confidence. And I did this one exercise about money with um, with a uh, coach. And it was so interesting because she had me sitting in a chair and then there was a chair across from me and in that chair was money. And I had to, you know, see what I had to... Um, you know, I just noticed that I was sitting like this. I was not open to receiving money. I was like, I don't really need you. My, these are my thoughts, right? Looking at our thoughts. I don't really need you. Um, so that's going to, if I don't think I need money, it's going to really influence my confidence in sales, right? Sales isn't, doesn't, you don't have to make it about money. It could be about the client and helping the client, you know, money's secondary. So, but my arms were crossed. I was kind of like, I don't really need you. Um, and so that was kind of my attitude. And so then we had to switch chairs and I had to be money. And it was so interesting because what came to me, not out of my head, but from my intuition, money was like this with its arms back. I am holding back a ton of myself from coming to you because you don't want me. That was eye opening. It's powerful. I didn't change right when away, we, but yeah. When we when we embody different positions, perspectives, and try and be the witness, try and be the observer of other alternative lenses. And we have in different societies, different cultures, sayings that embed into our sense, right? Money is the root of all evil. Um, right. You know, or, or, big boys don't cry, whatever it may be that you in your own society, your own upbringing, your own family or culture has interlaced and interlocked these various circuits in our brain that then manifest yeah. in interesting ways from, oh, I don't need you. I don't want you. And actually it's, it's a closed feeling, negative feeling to that, to allowing it to be, well, it's inert. I then de decide what it, could mean to me to others and what can flow an insert whether it's money gender race ai whatever the thing is that is there to ultimately um leverage humanity to do better to do more right. than we could yesterday so maybe i don't need the money but what if i set up a foundation and helped other yeah. people you know, maybe that's what I could do with the money. Um, money. I also learned how money has to always be in flow. So I started giving more money. I started, you know, we never say, well, I have enough air. Why do we treat money differently than air? We never say, you know, no, thanks. I don't want any more air. I've got, I've got enough, you know, so we just put this, yeah, this stuff on money. And um, in fact, in that exercise, I left it out, but we also had a chair beside us, which is a relative that taught us our beliefs about money. <laughs> and, and also it's, it's good to like, like, what do you feel when you think about money? Like, where do you feel it in your body? Um, I had a coach that would 
because I, I retired because I knew I wasn't feeling my feelings. So I had a coach that would ask me, what do you feel about something? I'm like, I don't know. I know what I think about it. I don't know what I feel about it and where I feel it in my body. So I've worked a ton on feeling and which is so important because one of my podcast guests said, when you shove your feelings to the basement, they lift weights. And my whole career after the divorce from Bruce, um, I shoved my feelings to the basement because I was a single parent. I had to just get by. And when he died, all those feelings that had lifted weights came up. So I dealt with a lot. And so understanding how we feel about things, not just how we think is really important too. It's powerful. I, I did a, a program through Coaches Rising at the end of last year, and it was about the neuroscience of change. And a lot of it was uh, semantic intelligence and the fact that we have, you know, denser neurons uh, in our fascia around our body more so than in our mm. brain. And that sense of embodied feelings that we can, you know, hold on to and we don't release and we uh, will either disassociate or will armor when we yeah. are in a certain situation. And how do you you know, it's not just a cognitive process to release. We can't think our way out of everything. Mm -hmm. It has to be a sense of both the physicality of changing movement, changing postures to help rewire the, the thought and the brain, you know. And I found it just utterly fascinating and so easy to tack into my lived experience as well. So whether that is, as, as you mentioned, you know, loved ones and loss, seeing death, cancer, various pieces. My um, person I had on the podcast yesterday um, had a fascinating story about um, her 40 year old son. When he was born, he was born with uh, all of the nerve system not functioning and they wanted to fully amputate all of his limbs. And he spent 19 years in very experimental um, surgery to try and rehabilitate, to be able to move and sense things. And just the adaptation we need throughout life when circumstances shift and change. Yeah. And the importance of who's around us, what's the data that we're receiving in? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it you know, uh, going in into our body and living there rent free to suddenly go bang in a dysfunction, in a disease. Right. Um, yeah. And youth, you can get away with it for a while, but it catches up. It, it catches, catches up. up when <laughs> it we, catches up for uh, sure. My, my last bit that I just wanted to share quickly when you were talking about uh, money and flow and these things was um, watching uh, the second avatar. Mm -hmm. And I rewatched the first one before and their, their notion that all energy just exists and it returns in this full cycle. And that when you die, you're just that energy is flowing and then it flows in again to, to something uh, else. And whatever our spirituality or beliefs of things, I think there's a lot that we can use in that when we're facing challenge, when we're facing mm -hmm. a situation that is suboptimum or not ideal or we're fearful of in your I'm, I'm interested in terms of your work potentially in some very highly stressful situations mm -hmm. in some really um you know contexts that matter mm -hmm. what were some of the things you observed in how people faced those that we might be able to benefit from in terms of dealing with fast pace of change, things shifting uh, about maybe some of the programs, some of the observations, some of the power of self-awareness. What are some of those things that you could perhaps share with us, Emily, when people are in high states of stress and serious situations? Well, one of the things that I've realized is, you know, when I was at the Naval Academy and even a lot of times as an officer and a lot of times as a civilian, um, somebody might say, you know, uh, how stressful can be a contracting officer be? Okay, it wasn't life or death, but 
it's a lot of data and spreadsheets. So I think self-awareness comes into, because I never had this one assessment. It's called, um, oh, I'm going to forget what it is. I think it's Emergenetics. This assessment showed that for me, data stuff, I scored an eight, meaning like 92% of people love data more than me. You know, that's not my strength. My strength is more in the heart-based, relationship-based. And so no wonder being a contracting officer stressed me out because I hate spreadsheets. And so you don't have to be in a, a wartime environment or you know, a stressful military environment, sometimes our jobs can cause us stress because we're maybe not in, in one that really plays to our strengths. So self-awareness and understanding our strengths is key. And, you know, your book is about adaptability quotient, which is like you, you know, being able to be adaptable is something else that I think we all need in this uncertain world. These, nothing is certain now. I mean, look, we just shot down four, four flying things in the sky and we don't even know what they are and that could cause stress. And so what I like about positive intelligence too, is that it, which I didn't have when I was working is because I felt like I was in, I was really stressed a lot and I didn't have the, the skills to deal with it. I think positive intelligence, I know it gets to the root cause of how, of why we feel stressed. And so it talked, Shirzad, who wrote the book, talks about um, you know the the thr the um, survive side of our brain, and that we have. Uh, he explains it simply because we have these saboteurs in the survive side of our brain. The judge judges ourselves. We all know we have an inner critic. We have uh, we judge our circumstances and situations. I mean, I was saying that you know my stress was caused by my boss and my job, and that's why I was so busy. And then all of a sudden, I realized it wasn't. Once I retired, it was really me. So it, this, this program helps you look at yourself. And then we have these um, other saboteurs, you know, you've probably seen them in yourself or in others, the avoider, the hypervigilant, the restless, the pleaser, the stickler, the hyper-rational, you know, all about data, the controller, you know, so understanding the thoughts that those saboteurs generate in our mind and being able to quiet our mind and not believe those thoughts. We've, they've been in our mind for so long, we tend to just like rubber stamp them and believe them. And, and so positive intelligence helps you to say, wait a second, what else could be true? It helps you switch to the, the right side of your brain, which is the thrive side of your brain. So I think if, you know, that's why I'm so passionate about getting into this in with government employees, because in all you cannot operate in a stressful environment 24 seven, you have to be able to, um, you know, help your autonomic nervous system recover so that you can achieve peak performance and well being. Um, and, and the, the uncertainty in our lives is not going to change anytime soon. So we have to be able to adapt. So we have to understand what's what we're thinking about that and knowing how to change it from a positive perspective i mean you hit on a couple of points there about the living in a extreme state for extended periods of time mm -hmm. so stress is incredibly powerful incredibly positive in short bursts right uh, it can serve us uh, in all sorts of interesting ways and for me a lot of our work is, is thinking about and understanding what are we trying to adapt? We're trying to adapt ourselves so that we can, oh, you're in this role. It requires you to do something. That's not you. Do you morph and adapt to become in flow with that? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to change the, my career and role? So I, I shift. Or do I want to change the system of how something is done? Right. And I guess this is all around our reflection of over a long period of time to sustain something. If every person who comes into that environment is chewed up and runs around, yeah. runs off after a while, there's something wrong in the system. You know, yeah. the system has to shift. And often we, uh, as human beings, feel that it's, you know, about us and us as a problem. And I've got to shift. I've got to adapt. I've got to fit. Elements of that are true. But mm -hmm. equally, we see need of change in the how in the processes in the yeah. systems in the insert whatever you want red tape you know the things that frustrate us that get us hot under the collar and sometimes that battle is too hard alone and sometimes yes. it's a battle that the timing's not right for 
But ultimately, this is about, I feel, progress. And you use these words, you know, flourishing and thriving. I believe in a society, in a world where we can achieve a greater volume of thriving and flourishing, not at the sacrifice of others, that it's a, you know, a balance scale. No, we can all rise uh, up that up that system. Was there something, so you've mentioned a few pieces from your coach, from positive intelligence that have helped shape your uh, Emily version 2.0, you know, for, mm-hmm. after the Navy, the coach, the podcast um, person. What do you foresee as parts of your future self of how you're really excited and, and showing up of um, how you'll serve leaders, teams, organizations? What does that look like for you? For me, you know, one of the things that you got me thinking about it, a couple things, uh, I want to just go back and, and say that, yeah, systems and stuff have to change and the way we operate has to change. But the people that have there, are, it's people that have to come up with those new ways. And if people are so stressed and overwhelmed and anxious, they're not going to be able to think innovatively, right? And creatively, they're just like always putting out it's the next paralyzed. fire. And we just, we have to get away from that. Um, And then another thing that I've learned from one of my coaches is it could be easy. And so I'm not going to read the whole story, but in this book, You You Squared by Price Pritchett, um, he talks, he tells the story of a fly and the fly is, he's sitting in a restaurant. He's watching this fly. The fly is just like flying against the window, trying to get out, right? Beating itself up. So let me get out. Let me get out. Let me get out that's how we are sometimes, right? Like, let me get out. Let me get out. Trying to If I try harder, I'm going to get out. Well, trying harder is not going to get that fly out, but just a few flat wing flaps away, the door is open. So it could be easy for that fly. How could we, maybe if we could get that stress and not think that we just have to keep trying harder, maybe it could be easy for us too. But in order to get out of that fear-based flight or flight, you know, some people say, well, it motivates me. I do my best work when I'm under stress. Well, you can't be under stress all the time and really do your best work. So for me in the future, I am, my goal is to, is to really help government employees um, experience the, the, what positive intelligence can bring. And, um, but not doing it from a push and try harder, but doing it from an allowing perspective every morning when I spend my quiet time, I just like, I just send love to government employees, you know, because I do believe that there's, you know, the collective consciousness and there's a way of sending energy to others. And so that's what I do and try to allow instead of pushing and in my own personal life, just, um, making sure that I'm. I'm going back and double checking and I actually do it every day. Like, am I, am I living the life that I love? Are there any changes I want to make? What feels heavy? So for me recently, what started to feel heavy was my podcast. I did over 200 episodes, but it started to feel heavy. I was enjoying it, but it started to feel heavy and I let it go before I just got resentful of it or whatever. Um, So I think it's important to to take a step back and kind of ask ourselves, you know, we, we do all this strategic planning for our companies. What do we do for ourselves? So what feels heavy for you? What would you like to experience in all areas of our lives? One of my coaches is Mary Morrissey, and she talks a lot about creating a life you love living. What would you love? That's the question, not whether you can have it or not, but what would you love? So I'm always thinking about like, and and coming up with what would I love next in my life? What do I want to experience? How do I want to be while I'm doing this? And um, so it's just a continuing uh, to grow to Emily 3.0, 4.0. We're always meant to grow. And uh, that's what I want to do. Is those multiple chapters in the book that reveals itself as we take each step, isn't it? Yeah. And just being welcoming to that, being curious to that, being playful in it. And even when things are heavy, you can be in a state of, oh, show me what it feels like to carry that when it's heavy versus, you know, you can still, oh, that's heavy, but be in a state of, I am in control of it. I'm choosing to unlearn 
uh, something that has been part of me and saying thank you to it you know yeah. and uh, thank you podcast for the 200 episodes that oh, was yeah. great I learned um, so much <laughs> I learned so much and it's a bit like you know as I grew up the the whole sense of quitting was a bad thing you know, mm -hmm. you stick with something, you, you know, you're learning a new sport. And of course, as a kid, you're trying all these things and it must frustrate the hell out of the parents because <laughs> one minute you're into this, then you're not playing that musical instrument, and then you're doing this sport and it's like, come on, uh, you know, you've yeah. got to stick with it. And there's elements, of course, where having some grit, having some pieces are really great. And there's mm -hmm. others where, OK, I have gone through a curve of understanding and I've now decided that's not for me anymore. And right. be okay with that. And right. you know, lots of cultures have the ceremonies, you know, where you, you're grateful for, you can burn a token of appreciation to an element that you're now saying goodbye to, to allow room for what's next. For what's next, to allow exactly. room to grow. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting ready to, I'm hoping today, I have a virtual assistant. He just finished this video for me. I hope he posts it today on LinkedIn. And you know, one of the one of the things that we do in positive intelligence is we are remind ourselves that we are really sage. We are not our saboteurs. We're really sage. We're kind of more like we were when we were like five and six year old kid. So this video is of my grandson who is six, and we spent some time together over the holidays, and he's jumping in the pool and stuff. But my point is that he always says, "This is going to be the best day ever." And, you know, what if we could approach our lives like that? Like, this is going to be the best day ever and all exciting because we really are more, our natural state is to have fun and be like that six-year-old. And we did this visualization um, when we were discussing the hyperachiever with Shirzad, who wrote Positive Intelligence. He said, and I'll just make it really short, but you, you know, you get out of your saboteur mind, you get into your thrive mind, and then you can imagine yourself as a kid playing and playing and having fun. Well, I imagine Marshall and I imagine the two of us putting together some Legos like we we've done and he's, and we're just having fun and it's just so exciting. And he, he wants to, he drops a piece. He goes, Oh, that's okay. Emmy, I'll get it and no stress. And he wants to put the hat on a different, you know, he does it differently than in the book. And, you know, there's no timeline. And then we bring in our hyperachiever selves. <laughs> and so, you know, it could, I would ruin it. Like my hyperachiever would ruin it. Come on, you drop the piece. You know, how could you drop a piece? We have this deadline. We have to keep going. You know, you just add so much stress to it. <laughs> Right? Your hyperachiever can. It's all about finishing the Legos in this amount of time and having it look just like the picture. I mean, maybe your stickler thinks that. So it's like, let's get back to being our six-year-old selves and have fun. That's what life's supposed to be about. Yeah. I think for, for me, it's the poetic dance between each of these islands. Mm -hmm. Living in any one of those for too long is not, not great. You know, we right. need to have moments where we're having a really shitty day and say it's a shitty day. That's um, right. And not to wash that with Martin Seligman, you know, with positivity of those things and just saying, okay, but I'm not going to let it be in the driving seat for the rest of my life. You know, right. I, I might, for some people, it's a, a, a moment for others. It might be a few days, depending on your own context, but the often way we can get out of that is through connection, connection yes. to something a connection yes. maybe it's to this is the future version of your own self that you want to mm -hmm. be a connection to a you know a grandchild mm -hmm. uh, a connection to a mission a connection to a colleague that can help us just reframe when we're either too up high up in the sky or right. too way down low and I think for all of us throughout our lives throughout our journeys we have moments where no I need an overwhelm of gratitude, of positivity, of these things, because I have been bombarded with negative, whether that's because of my environment, the country I've lived in, the news I listened to, mm -hmm. or just what I heard. Even when there was positive around, all I could hear was the other voices that were negative and what would go wrong, as you mentioned, the sort of saboteurs. What would you say about just that that reflection and and balance of um oh there's too much positivity going on right now versus uh no there is some requirement and value of negative what's your sort of thought around mm -hmm. that 
Well, I'd say, you know, to my, um, one of my coaching uh, certifications is this in energy leadership, right? And there's, you know, seven levels. Level seven is probably where Jesus was, you know, <laughs> you know, just joy all the time and everything or the Dalai Lama. And, you know, level uh, three is I'm fine. Everything's good. Um, and at level three, you kind of don't feel the lower level feelings, which are the lower level energy. Level two is like anger. You know, you're really, you know, and level one is just, ah, oh, F it. I'm done. I'm just withdraw. I just want to like sit on the couch all day. So, uh, we, we, we take this assessment and we can see where we spend our energy, our time in different energy levels. And everyone spends time in different energy levels throughout the day. And then the other, the assessment also shows where do we go when we feel stressed? I go to level one when I feel stressed. And so, and I think I, I do see on um, social media, especially even on LinkedIn, I see more and more people and I've done it too, sharing that life isn't always perfect. And we do go to the, you know, I do go to this level one. The, I think the thing is to recognize it and to know if you're in level one by choice or just by default, to recognize that I'm in this level two energy conflict or I'm in this level three energy of, you know, everything's fine, but you know, it really isn't. That's, I think the difference and it's okay to be, I sometimes let myself be an energy level one for a weekend or couple of days. I mean, but I think we all have enough experience, hopefully a lot of us to, to, to know, I mean, some people it's more challenging to know that, you know, take a shower the next day, get, you know, reach out to a friend, um, do something good for yourself and you'll feel better. It doesn't always last. Yeah. I, I hear you. And I feel that for many who might be listening, who are in any one of those given, uh, energy levels, is to try and balance the be a, the observer, be the witness, yeah, be the observer. But not the the label of you know. Oh, I am a failure, or you know, associating that emotion and that energy and that feeling with yourself, rather right. than it is flowing through you. Uh, right, you can observe that and and give yourself the permission to be in and move. And as you said, is it through choice and control? Uh, or is it different circumstances? And all of this is, you know, the the perspective of the mind. No, that's <laughs> true. It? And yeah. that's why in positive intelligence, we don't say like, I am a hyperachiever or I am a victim. We say I have a victim saboteur, which kind of disempowers the saboteur. What I really am is sage. You know, I'm a child of God. You know, I'm I'm just infinite possibilities. You know, I'm that's who I am. I'm not this victim saboteur right yeah and some of the um leaders that you're working with at the moment and the organizations that you're working with to help them leverage the benefits of positive intelligence of bringing that self-awareness and then helping them transition to being more mentally fit being fit capable of dealing with all of those roller mm -hmm. coasters of of what life life is what are some of the, um, you know, realities that they're facing and how is this helping that? Um, you know, what are some of the real stories of organizations that are really transforming the way they're doing things, embracing these new opportunities of uh, assessments of looking at feelings, you know, yeah. which for some people and some departments is alien you know right 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 it's not uh not on my watch type thing so where has that impacted how has it impacted and what would you recommend if someone's thinking about it but maybe they're a little bit nervous because it is different to what they've normally done in mm -hmm. how they support people yes and positive intelligence has really only been doing this for about two years so fairly new but I, what i would say is that um I think a, a key thing is to, to have the leader go through the program with their teammate, team members, to not say, to not point out that, you know, the lowest performers are the ones that need a coach. So you're going through, you know, it's really, um, and I would not force anybody to go through it. So 
when we change, our external environment changes. I interviewed my um, roommate from the Naval Academy on a podcast, and she was talking. She has the controller saboteur, and she was, she and her husband were both home together during COVID, and it was really stressful. Her controller saboteur was telling her these stories about, you know, how her she and her husband were interacting, and she he didn't go through the program, but she did, and her energy changed, and that changed him. Um, so his responses. So even if you're able, if you're not sure, like, oh, maybe all of my employees wouldn't want to go through it. I wouldn't force anybody to, I would just let them, you know, people who want to go through it, go through it. And, um, and then maybe others will pick up on, oh, look at the change, how, how that's helped. Um, we also let family members uh, get the app. So that's important too, because we look at the whole person. Um, it's not just how you are at work, but we know that when you're at home, stress can happen there too. And so it's um, a program that's beneficial for kids and spouses and, you know, significant others. So we take care of the whole person. So I think that just, um, you know, trying it out also, you know, it doesn't have to be the whole organization make a decision to try, but, you know, send five or 10 people through and then use the, look at them to say, don't take my word for it, have them tell you, you know, was it beneficial, but it just, it helps with uh, stress, improving relationships. I can see how it helps with, um, especially in uh, federal government to become a senior executive, you um, have these executive core qualifications that you have to, you know, show that you have business acumen, that you can lead across boundaries. And a lot of the challenges we have right now in federal, state, and local government is um, our challenges that take working across organizational boundaries to solve. You know, we have earthquake and, or, or um, and different organizations have to work together to deal with that. We have the border issues, different organizations. We have hurricanes. It's, you know, different organizations that have to all get together and work together and um, th this program helps with that too. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, it's a fundamental one, isn't it? The ability for humans to play well together. With each yeah. Other, you know, uh, and knowing our areas, knowing where we need to unlearn things, shift, what is, ah, I'm protecting this, this is my fiefdom, to yeah. allowing just that playful opportunity to find new ways is often hard when it's under stress, as you mentioned before. How can yeah. we be creative? How can we innovate when we're too stressed? We need an element of it. Um, otherwise, we'll be on the sofa you know, yeah. Netflixing. <laughs> so right. we need an element of something that motivates us, that gets us stressed enough to say, um, there is an event here. There's something that is going on that I want to contribute to. Mm -hmm. And that that situation is just really interesting, isn't it? That this cross collaboration is much more happening of our time. Yes. It's not just departmental and inside a company, but it's from company to company, department to department and industry to industry. Mm -hmm. And as we've become more connected, that's become possible. Historically, it was not really that right. possible. You'd work with the people that you could, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of touch and feel and connect with. Well, now we can do that anywhere in the world. Right. And so it's it exponentially got more complicated because we've got all of these different cultures, generations, approaches, educations, thoughts, ways of doing things. And we're saying, OK, now play well <laughs> together, collaborate, you know, uh, different departments, work on different things, come up with new policies, come up with new ways. And we haven't trained those muscles. It's a bit like no. you mentioned. You know, athlete, I trained my physical ones, didn't train my mental ones. Now right. we need to train a lot of our, how do we collaborate across different complexities of human people uh, in different ways? And I think that's the, the magic source that coaching can provide right now, where management mm. was a great creator of value and impact. Um, historically, I think now coaching can be part of that. In terms of the, as we come to a close, the last thing that I ask every guest at the end is something around curiosity, Emily. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, posed around a two-part question for you. And it was, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And what was it? <laughs> I can tell you, it was that, a couple of weeks ago on a Thursday, I said to myself, I'm tired of this cold weather. I want to go on a trip by myself. So by Saturday, I was in Puerto Rico. 
where it was warm. So I just, the old Emily would have been like, ah, it's kind of expensive. I don't know. Should you go? That's kind of selfish. Just going by yourself. No, I took myself on a trip. And um, that that's where I've really grown is in my self-love and compassion for myself. Mm -hmm. What a great message to end on, to, to think about. And I always, you know, one of the great analogies is, on the aircraft, you know, you put your own oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. If we're here to serve people that we love and care about, we need to make sure we're doing that for ourselves in order to then serve others in our most powerful way. People want to get in touch with you if they're curious to learn more uh, about PQ, about the work that you do, about maybe some of the books that you've recommended. We'll link some of the books, the U squared, uh, the PQ one. But if they mm -hmm. want to get in touch with you, how do they best do that, Emily? I think the best way is LinkedIn. And my name is spelled with a A H A R M A N. So LinkedIn, and then I have a website, emilyharman.com. And you could uh, message me from that website. So those are two good ways to reach out to me. That's fantastic. It's been a real joy to just uh, be on the journey of your couple of chapters so far and uh, how you've observed your own self through transitions. And I'm sure that many who've listened today, things have resonated with them and you might just have inspired a few people to think about um, maybe their last breath uh, and how do they want to reflect on their present uh, decisions and choices today and maybe pop to Puerto Rico and, yeah. you know, <laughs> go on these adventures that do um, bring energy to the soul and the mind and the smile. So deep gratitude for your time today. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Ross. I really enjoyed being on your show. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQ AI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.